Welcome class. This is going to be our last lecture for the semester. We're going to zoom through from the 70s all the way to the um, controversial election of 2000 where George Bush Jr. gets elected. Um, it's a big swath in American history. Um, and I really don't want to go beyond that. Uh, I want this to be the last lecture I'm going to give you. Um, next week, I'll probably just have a video for you to do a reaction to because I really want you to start to work on your research papers. So um, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, the last lecture I gave was around the 60s, um, civil rights movement, and now we're going to go into the 70s. Now, um, in the you know, right at 68 and on, you're starting to see like, you know, a lot of um, war protests and uh, anti-war movement, you know, civil rights. Um, about the only thing Johnson had going for him was the little things, he, the thing, not little things, excuse me, but the things he did for civil rights. But um, the war just kind of, ex you know, it amplified the racism in the United States and then um, people not believing the government. They're saying they're winning the war, but they're looking at TV and it doesn't look that way. So you have this huge credibility gap. Then you have the, you know, in the seventies, we'll later have that Pentagon papers coming out, which um, explain all the lies that were behind Vietnam. So when, you know, by 68, you know, Johnson's done. He, um, he, because what he's done is he finishes Kennedy's term. And then he runs and wins his next term in office. So he literally has one more term to go, but he decides not to run. And so um, this leaves the, the, um, the field open for, you know, a second run by Richard Nixon. And he, um, and he, he you know, speaks about like, you know, um, I'm going to bring back law and order because look at the rioting in the streets and, you know, all these huge protests and he's, he says, I'm, I'm the law and order president, and I'm the president of the silent majority. Those who are happy with America the way it was, those who don't want change. And so this is what he runs on. He also runs on the lie that he's going to end Vietnam. He's, you know, and we will talk about that in a bit. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you have seen the rhetoric about like, oh, um, the Republicans were the party of Lincoln and uh, the Democrats were the party of slavery, which is true to an extent. But also, um, you also have to understand that both of these parties have shifted in time from their positions. And when we, one of the biggest shifts we see, and you know, when people are like, why do minorities vote, you know, Democrat, you know, when that's the party of slavery and so forth, is what we see happen is, with um, Johnson's uh, legislation, um, as far as civil rights, he's a Southern senator, and he, you know, he was a Southern senator, became president, but you know, he represented the South, and he in no way, you know, should have been the way he was, but he was, you know, he was for civil rights, and so when he, you know, passes all this legislation for civil rights. Um, a lot of the South is now unhappy with the Democratic Party and Johnson specifically as well, which is one of the reasons he doesn't run again. Um, and so the Republican leadership see an opening. So they have what they call this Southern strategy in which they're going to go in and win all these Southern votes, you know, by promoting these, you know, words like states' rights, which are just literally linked to slavery and the Civil War, um, and, you know, and, and just really um, amplifying the racism of the South and winning off of that and bringing them over to the Republican Party. And like I said, you know, and so this old school conservative Southern racist, you know, people start, you know, now do this complete flip flop and you see them all going to the Republican Party because they are now the party of peace and the, the party of um, not, um, not, I'm sorry, not peace, but law and order. They're the party of, um, you know, promoting big business and, you know, all, all this stuff that people usually think of when they're thinking of a successful big business. But big business is usually, you know, um, on their way up, they've crushed a bunch of little businesses. So they're, they're, sh they're shifting and taking all this, the stuff you hear today, and they're absorbing all this, you know, this idea of, you know, conservative values, family values, and all these things that they, these trigger words that they use. And, you know, and they're anti, you know, um, desegregation, they're all kinds of stuff. So they're able to, this is when the, the Republican Party totally shifts 
and takes on all these um, standards and all these ideas and all these concepts that have been held long by the old white elite in the South and also the, the lower classes who have been preached their whole lives that they're better because they're white and, you know, black people, you know, are inferior and black people cause crime and all this stuff. So they, they feed off all this. And this will only continue to be enhanced in, you know, as, as time moves on. But so use, utilizing the Southern strategy is how the South, I mean, how the Republican Party switches its party platforms and also gains all of these votes in the South. Now, one thing um, Nixon promises is what he calls Vietnamization. How This is how he's going to end the war in Vietnam. He's going to slowly back away and let the Vietnamese fight it out for themselves without American troops. You know, and one of the many things he does once he's elected is he doesn't, um, he doesn't end the war. In fact, he expands the war and starts bombing Laos and Cambodia, which are countries that neighbor of Vietnam, and he expands the war into those countries um, because a lot of times the Viet, Viet Cong would attack us and flee to those countries and we weren't at war, so we necessarily couldn't go in there, although we did at times. But anyway, so he ends up expanding the war, not ending the war. Now, as far as Nixon's presidency, it's a really interesting thing to examine. I was actually kind of surprised when I, when I, when I went back to school and um, restudied Nixon. I hadn't realized, so, you know, he's very, you know, all over the place as far as his policies. That, I mean, a couple of things he did do in positive lights is, um, you know, one of the first nuclear weapon treaties, SALT-1, is negotiated through Nixon. Nixon also normalizes, um, normalizes um, diplomatic relations with China, opening China, then the Chinese markets to the United States. And these are all positive things. Um, and so another thing, area you wouldn't think, a, you know, a conservative Republican would be in is, you know, under Richard Nixon, the EPA is passed as far, you know, creating the EPA. And then um, you also have um, the Endangered Species Act, all about looking at the environment and preserving the environment and preserving species, which is really interesting that this is something that, you know, like I said, a conservative Republican would, you know, sign into law. Also during the 70s. And I forget the name of it, and I really I haven't checked it out to be you know honest, but I want to check it out. Is the struggle for the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment? You know, what this was an amendment stating that women were the same, you know, got paid the same as men, and they should have the same protections as men. This thing has never been ratified. There was this whole fight, you know, between the conservatives and, and you know, and the conservatives and the liberals in Congress and in the states. Because they pass it through, but it needs to be ratified because it's an amendment. An amendment must be ratified by the states, and it has never been ratified. But it's in the 70s when we start to see the, you know, the, the women's um, rights movement start to move forward and start to push for equal pay, equal treatment. You know, you have Title IX, which is, you know, if you're in sports in college or in high school, allows women to participate in any club in the high school, whether, you know, it's athletics or UIL or something similar. You also have in the Middle East, and this becomes a, an issue for the United States. Um, you have in 1973, a war known as Yom Kippur War. Israel's fighting with its Arab neighbors. The United States supports Israel with arms and um, money. And so um, when we do this, this put, paints us in a bad light with other, um, the surrounding Muslim countries. And this becomes an issue, you know, um, later on, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a bit. Um, so uh, as far as domestic policy, you start to see like under Nixon, you have, you know, OSHA being created, EPA, and you have the very beginnings of this war on drugs. This um, concept that, um, you know, all, almost like prohibition, all society's problems are based on drugs. If we could just get rid of drugs, then our society would be better. Um, and so, but we now know, and I mean, either that drugs and alcoholism and stuff like that, they're all symptoms of something bigger, some sort of, you know, there's something else at play and that's what we need to look at. Um, but, you know, he starts this campaign, you know, against marijuana, especially what's really fascinating is when he becomes president, he actually, um, commissions a, a medical report on, med mar on, um, excuse me.
he actually, you know, issues this medical report on marijuana. And when it comes back to him, it basically just says it, it, it makes you hungry. It's not addictive. And that's it. He threw that report in the trash and went on with his anti-drug rhetoric. Um, under, you know, next you have the Apollo 11 moon landing. And so when we look at the Young Kipper War, this is where um, we start to see um, it biting us in the butt. Because these Arab nations, which are oil producing nations, um, saw us stand for Israel and not help them. So as a punishment to us, they start to cut off our oil supply. And this hurts our economy immensely. You have, you know, now there's not enough oil, not enough gas. So gas um, prices surge. And when gas prices surge, so do the prices of everything else. Because think about it. How does things get to the store? You know, through trucks. And trucks are now charging more, you know, because gas is higher. And then products become higher. Then less people can afford these products. So then we're not buying as many products. And we get what we call stagflation. You know, high prices, high unemployment. And also the fact that, you know, there was very little gas to go around. So you'd have huge gas lines, people waiting for hours just to put gas in their car, and there would be limits on gas. So this becomes a major issue on into the 70s, into Carter and so forth. Um, another thing uh, that's going on at the time is, like I said, Richard Nixon's a law and order president. Uh, this is how he promotes himself. And he's totally against the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. In fact, you know, him and other conservative Republicans these people as possible communists and so a very secret um, program is started under the FBI known as Cointelpro in which these guys would spy on American citizens you know people like Martin Luther King and you know all these you know civil rights activists so they would try to get dirt on them or they would just try to you know put misinformation out there about them you know just to so they could lose their credibility and you know all, all of this is illegal so, you know they weren't getting they weren't you know you um getting warrants and stuff but they were doing they were doing this because they saw them as a threat you know to this conservative order and so you have the law and order president you know breaking a lot of laws so then we get into watergate now watergate um starts off small and then becomes big um, I am not a big proponent of conspiracy theories. Um, a lot of them, you know, have no real merit to them. But one of the re reasons that people will uh, honestly go forward with like, oh, well, you never really know, is sometimes conspiracy theories are correct. And Watergate is the perfect example of it. Now, Richard Nixon is a very paranoid man. He has this little enemies list he's made. Everyone's out to get me. I need to win. So what he ends up doing is he hires these guys, you know, um, some are ex-CIA or whatever, to break into the Democratic National Party headquarters, which was in, water, in the Watergate Hotel, to bug it, to find out what strategies they're going to use against him in the upcoming election. Now, um, these guys are caught. They're the, the worst burglars ever. And so they're, you know, they're in, you know they, go, they go to get arraigned in court. Now, there's two reporters sitting in that courtroom, and that's Woodward and Bernstein. Now, these guys are like any reporters. They look for stories. And so one of the places they hang out is a courthouse to find, see if they hear a good, you know, hear a good story, something that they can run with. And so they're there, and they're watching this. And they're like, you know, these are supposed to be, you know, they're posing as common criminals, but they don't look like common criminals. And their lawyers certainly aren't. You know, they're upscale, high-paid attorneys. So something seems fishy to them. Like, you know, who are these, like, the, you know, supposedly lower level criminals that can afford all this? Like, why would you be breaking in? And so this seems suspicious to them. Their little ears perked up and they decided to investigate. And as their investigation moves forward, um, they start to um, get hints that this is something orchestrated by the White House, maybe even ordered by President Nixon. So, you know, they, they begin this investigation and, the, you know, and slowly some series of articles are coming out. And, of course, the White House is like saying if the word fake news existed, it would have been, you know, shouted out. Um, but one person who is guiding these guys throughout this whole thing is someone that they had to give a code name for because they promised never to reveal his identity. And the code name is a little funny to everyone. Um, he, was a, he was coined Deep Throat. 
And what this guy was doing was kind of feeding them information, not giving them like a whole bunch of information at once, but feeding them so they could find it themselves. And, you know, one of the big things was he was always like, follow the money. They got paid. Who do they get paid by? And slowly they linked the payment from, you know, President Nixon's um, committee to reelect him, which is really funny. You know, the acronym is CREEP. Um, and and it's more, you know, they may, are able to link it directly to the president. And it turns out, and this only came out a couple of years ago because the reporters promised that they would not um, reveal his identity till he passed away. Well, a couple of years ago, he passed away. And who this guy was, was assistant director to the FBI. This guy knew Nixon was shady from the beginning and tried to investigate him. But, you know, he was always being shut down. And then um, when Hoover dies, the guy who ran the FBI since its inception, you know, um, um, Nixon places somebody in there who he can control. So that guy just completely shuts down every investigation because, you know, that this guy was doing on Nixon because he just knew something shady was going on. So in, in a sense, um, he just wanted that, you know, wanted the public to know what was really going on. So he helps them and guides them toward this. You know, and, and so as the months, you know, start to progress, he ends up winning the election, but the, you know, but these rumors don't go away. And eventually it becomes an investigation. Um, they try to subpoena um, Nixon as they find out he records every meeting in the Oval Office. Nixon refuses to give him the tapes, citing executive privilege. The Supreme Court rules against him, saying no one is above the law. They get, he hands over the tapes, which have missing, I think it's like five or 15 minutes, I can't recall at this moment, which we'll never know what was on them. But all of this is just like, you know, the more they dig, the more stuff they're finding. And so impeachment proceedings begin. But as they're digging, you know, Nixon decides it's better to get out while the getting's good. And he becomes the first president in history to resign from the office. Now, um, one of the reasons he resigns is he there was all kinds of other shady dealings he was involved in. And, as, and he was afraid that as Congress moved forward digging that they would find other stuff. So best to nip it in the bud. And he resigns. And by this point, like people have very little trust in government. Um, so when he resigns, his vice president takes over, and this is Gerald Ford. What is really f interesting is Gerald Ford is the first non-elected U.S. president in, and only non-elected U.S. president in history. Because Gerald Ford was not elected, like, you know, Nixon did not run with Gerald Ford to become president. He, rode, he ran with Spiro Agnew. But Spiro Agnew gets arrested and goes to jail for bribery, a sign of things to come. So he appoints Gerald Ford to be his vice president. So he was never actually elected. So when, you know, Nixon resigns, Ford, you know, becomes president. So becoming the first unelected president. And, you know, he comes in because, mind you, um, Watergate's going on, but this energy crisis, this stagflation, all this stuff is still happening. And this is the, this is the government and the society, you know, Ford inherits. One of the things he does do, though, in you know, drawing a lot of criticism, is he pardons Richard Nixon. And one thing that a lot of people don't understand about pardons, and not even Nixon, in several interviews he refused to acknowledge it, is when you accept a pardon from somebody, at the same time that you're accepting it, you're accepting guilt. Meaning, like, I, you know, you have to have been guilty of something for me to have to pardon you. So, you know, a little interesting dynamic there. Um, but he pardons Nixon. His reasoning, what he tells the American people is we got bigger fish to fry than spend another year or two involved in investigations and trials. We need to fix the economy. We need to you know, solve this energy crisis. And so um, when we're looking at the energy crisis, like I said, you're seeing long lines for oil. You're seeing um, you know, prices going up, people losing jobs, gas shortages. It's just crazy. And um, Gerald Ford, you know, doesn't do much to um, alleviate this. Um, and as he's um, and through it during his administration, uh, stuff comes out about the CIA committing, you know, different assassinations in Latin America and in Africa and in the Middle East. Also under him, a lot of the great society bills that were initiated by Congress, he vetoes. And so that, you know, he's losing on all aspects. He's making the government look bad. He's not solving, 
you know, the energy crisis. Um, he pardons Nixon. He's trying to kill the Great Society. So you can see, you know, he's hurting all aspects of his chances to actually get elected. So um, the person who challenges him in 76 is Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter's a Democrat. He, you know, presents himself as an honest man, a peanut farmer, very well educated. Um, he reaches out to minorities. He wants to, you know, he, he looks at the, there's issues with social classes. There's issue with race. And he wants to do something about this. So, you know, he's appealing to, you know, broadly to different people. So um, Carter wins the election and he comes in with, you know, we're going to, you know, look to alternative fuels. We're going to look to, um, you know, what else can we use besides gas or oil so that we're not dependent and don't get hurt by another embargo. So he creates a Department of Energy and he has people start to look into, you know, alternative fuels, which is really interesting. They're doing the 70s and we're barely coming around to it now. You know, also during the 70s, um, the you know, United States starts to decline as, you know, its, its image of a superpower starts to decline and it starts to weaken. Um, and a lot of it is like we're kind of like um, gun shy. We, you know, after Vietnam, we kind of want to avoid conflict because we don't want to, you know, lose some another war. Um, the War Powers Act is passed to try to keep the, you know, the president from, you know, I mean, it doesn't try. It keeps the president from making war without getting any um uh, they need to have um, congressional approval for war. Um, and so as the and part of this whole Cold War thing is that we're trying to maintain our military. And these costs are just getting more and more expensive for the United States. Now, when it comes to, you know, human rights and foreign policy, Carter, Carter um, stands up, speaks out against oppressive regimes in Latin America and, and, and against apartheid in South, South Africa and apartheid, if you don't know. Um, what that is, it was, you know, it was a systemic uh, creation of a society in South Africa where, you know, blacks were officially second class citizens. They couldn't, they could only live in townships unless they were working as a maid or whatever. And then they could live with their, you know, employers. They had no rights. This leads to, you know, a long period of unrest. You know, um, this is when um, Nelson Mandela gets imprisoned, um, you know, in this very repressive, bloody regime. He also... Um, you know, tries to reform the CIA, however, briefly for them to operate within the law and try to end all these, you know, shady assassinations and stuff. And he also negotiates and, you know, to give back the Panama Canal to the Panamanian people. Now, um, under Carter, we see several things getting, you know, um, stuff that we see now today. I mean, of course, it's being rolled back, you know, in, you know, with under the recent administration, but we see him, you know, try to pass legislation to try to and control the use of oil, you know, tax sales and gas guzzling cars, try to convert utilities out of oil, you know, and um, de deregulate the oil and natural gas markets, tax credits to homeowners who like, you know, get solar panels or do something to increase efficiency of power and research into alternative fuels. One area they were looking at was nuclear power. But um, then there was this horrible incident um, at um, Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, where the nuclear reactor almost melted down. What's fascinating is Carter actually had a degree in atomic energy, and he actually suits up and shows up to try to stop this, but they eventually are able to stop it, and it doesn't melt down. So happily, we do not have a Chernobyl here, but we almost did. Uh, going towards foreign policy as well, you know, um, uh, Jimmy Carter is the first president to bring some sort of peace, some sort of negotiations in um, the Middle East. He actually gets um, Egypt and Israel to actually have a, you know, an agreement between them. And basically what the agreement was, was Egypt recognizes Israel's right to ex exist and Israel um, agrees to give back the land they took during the Yom Kippur War. And the Six Day War. They, every time Israel has these wars, they expand their borders more and more. They're still doing it to this day. Um, and so they took land from Egypt and they agreed to give it back to them in exchange for recognition. And this is the first ever, you know, um, peace process in the Middle East, you know, which is still a quagmire to this day. Now, um, looking at the Middle East, one thing that does not go well for Jimmy Carter and um, and his administration is what happens in Iran. 
in Iran, there is a um, the Shah, which is the king, is um, in, is kind of running Iran like an iron fist. He's a very um, repressive um, leader. His people look at him as a you know as a dictator. And he's a puppet of the U.S. government. And eventually, his people you know they had had enough, and they organize under the Ayatollah Khomeini, and they have a revolution in Iran, kicking the Shah out of Iran. And, you know, and then trying to, you know, get Western influence out of Iran. These are Islamic fundamentalists. Um, and so the Ayatollah, I mean, excuse me, the Shah is on the run. And they want him to, because they want to try him for crimes that he committed as dictator in Iran. Well, the Shah gets sick. He has cancer. And he's trying to find a place to get treatment. He seeks treatment in the U.S. We allow him to come in. Uh, the Iranian people see this as a slap in the face. So they stormed the U.S. Embassy, taking 52 hostages. They held them for 444 days, and this is known as the Iran hostage crisis. And so um, Carter, you know, his administration, you know, tries their best to release, you know, try to find a way to negotiate with these people to get them to release our hostages. And um, really, he's able to make no headway into it so eventually in april of 1980 um he gives the go-ahead for um operation eagle claw which was a secret commando mission to invade iran rescue the hostages unfortunately um it did not go well a lot of the helicopters that they were going to use to invade um um, desert sands get in their engines, jams them. You know they crash. There's a huge, a lot of lo- loss of life, and you know it just makes him look even worse. Like you can't even mount a rescue operation. So his, you know, his approval numbers are shrinking and shrinking. So in comes Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is you know a conservative out of um, California, and he. Um, you know, talks about like, you know, we need, you know, we, we need to, you know, uh, make, bring America back to the forefront, make it a superpower again, out of this conservative movement, this new right, which is all about, you know, free enterprise, less regulation, sh- shrink the government, you know, um, don't tax the rich, uh, put more money into national defense. And, you know, this whole idea of family values and this conservative, you know, uh, ideally, ideal of family values, which, you know, you know, doesn't really apply family values as you know to all people. Just their their concept of family values. And what interesting thing is happening is that you know he wants to cut taxes, he wants to do all this stuff, but at the same time he wants to build up the military. But where do you get money to build up the military if you're not taxing people? So we get a huge deficit under Reagan. Defense spending is you know gets out of hand. We get the biggest deficit ever. Um, you know, we're spending on all kinds of new systems and bombing systems. And so, you know, we run in, you know, we run in the red. Um, it, we, we see this, you know, just going into the negative, into the billions and trillions of dollars. So, you know, here he is spending all this money, but not collecting taxes. So we go into the red. Now, um, this idea of family values was, you know, it's a very interesting, you know, conservative centered um, concept. Um, we see our, you know, dropout rates are high. We see, you know, um, our American education system isn't doing well. And he's thinking this is the decline of the family. That's what's causing all this stuff. And this leads to high rates of homelessness. And, you know, and so he's, you know, saying that, you know, it's this loss of family values that's causing this. And so we see, you know, people, um, they, they attack affirmative action, saying that that's hurting jobs. You know, we're looking at an area, you know, all these large areas of poverty. And so one of the things he's talking about when he's doing this and promoting this is that one of the many reasons we have these issues is because of the welfare state. You know, he coins the term this welfare queen, these, this you know, woman who has 10 kids and lives like a queen in her you know, one bedroom apartment, um, you know, just this is tax and draining on the system. This is why we're having so many issues. You know, never really seeing, you know, um, the reality behind it. No, you know, if you're, if you're not putting money into social programs, if there's no jobs being created, 
which is, you know, in a sense what he argues for when he says he's going to, you know, um, not tax the rich, saying that they'll create jobs, they'll do this. None of that happened. And so he's just exacerbating an already bad situation. Then you talk about bad situations. Um, another area and another um, incident that comes out of the 80s and, you know, and uh, is not properly addressed is the AIDS epidemic of the 80s. Reagan was really slow to respond because this is in the term that most conservatives, oh, it's this homosexual problem. Who really cares? You know, they're, they're not leaving good, you know, family. They're not maintaining good family values, not conservative values. So it takes them a long time to do anything about it. So, you know, this thing claims, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. And what we're looking at, and in, it's really funny because the only reason he actually steps up to do something is his wife, Nancy Reagan's hairdresser, who happened to be gay, died of AIDS. And that suddenly woke her up and told her husband. And that's when, you know, some work is done, but not a lot. And um, we see, you know, huge numbers of deaths and neglect of these poor people. Uh, it's starting in San Francisco, then spreading to New York. Um, we also see, uh, once again, in another tech, we look at family values as, you know, um, the war on drugs, which is really interesting. We see Reagan in the war on drugs because in a little while I'm going to talk about what happens to the Iran. I mean, excuse me, uh, what, ha what happens when we look at, you know, the Iran-Contra scandal is drugs are heavily tied into it. But anyway, so we see in the 80s, this cuts to social programs because that seems to be the problem of why people are poor. So let's just make them poorer. Um, we start to see crack cocaine emerge in the 80s and spread throughout the United States. And so this whole, like, we have a drug problem, but there's a, you know, there's some stuff going on in the background, especially when it comes to crack, and I'll get to that in a bit. Now, as we, we look at um, Reagan's foreign policy, you know, he, he blames Carter for, you know, the decline in American prestige, the Amer you know, in, in American um, power. And so he, he wants to get us back there. So he increased military spending. And then he looks to, you know, confront challenges that are happening all over the world. America needs to step in. America needs to be the world's police officer. And so we see um, him intervening uh, in Lebanon when there's fighting, uh, you know, um, there's an outbreak of fighting in Lebanon between Israelis and Arabs. We, you know, we, should, then we send in the Marines to help um, quell this fighting. Uh, there's a there's an attack on a Marine base killing hundreds of them. Um, and so as we're, you know, we're seen once again to be supporting, you know, Israel, you know, once again, uh, anti-American, you know, hostility in Iran grows again, and they take six more hostages in 83. And, you know, Reagan responds with, you know, we will not negotiate with terrorists. But what is really going on in the you know, Reagan, uh, the, you know, all this is going on at the same time. You know, Reagan's committed to fighting communists in Latin America. Who are these communists? Well, they're not exactly communists. In Latin America, we've been, we've been propping up dictators there since, you know, um, you know, the days of the big stick diplomacy with Theodore Roosevelt, because dictators sell, you know, um, you know, do good business in America. They literally sell us their resources. We impoverish them, you know, but, you know, we impoverish the countries, but they they do well. We do well, you know, and um, we, we own a lot of literally we own a lot of Latin America. So, you know, the people in many of these countries decide at a certain point, you know, they want their countries for their own they want to fight back so there's a lot of uprisings but they're always labeled as communist uprisings like the one in nicaragua a group of sen uh, named uh, called sandinistas take power they start talking about like um socialized medicine free education even paying you know um women for the work they do at home and this all sounds like communism to us as, you know to reagan so reagan wants to do something to help um, overthrow this group of Sandinistas, there's a group called the Contras, which means against. And he, he starts supporting these Contras with money and guns. But quickly what we find out is that these guys are just forming death squads and just going after enemies. It had nothing to do with a revolution. These people were, you know, just trying to enact revenge. And so when Congress finds out that this is what our money is being used for and our guns are being used for, they cut funding. And so this... You know, this is an issue for Ronald Reagan. So he, here he has hostages in Iran, 
He has Congress cutting off his funding in Nicaragua. So what does he do? Well, his administration comes up with this covert illegal plan to solve, you know, to solve both problems at once. Um, so the government illegally sells weapons to Iran because they're at war with Iraq in order to get the hostages released. So here he is giving in to terrorists. You know, he's saying, you know, we don't negotiate with terrorists, but we certainly did. Then um, he sold them. You know, he didn't just give it to them. He sold them. So there was a profit made there. This, of course, was an illegal thing. So they don't have to report it to Congress. So what they use, what they use the funds for is to, you know, further fund the Contras illegally. And then, you know, earlier I was talking about the war on drugs and how ironic it is, is um, the CIA seeks to gather more funding for this illegal war. So they start to make deals with drug cartels. And they help open up um, the sale of crack in the United States. That's why you have a huge crack epidemic. All these illegal drug sales are helping to fund the war in Nicaragua. And so this is their way of, you know, killing two birds with one stone. Eventually, this comes out. And um, these, this becomes a huge um, scandal for Reagan. Um, he goes forth and, um, you know, at first he talks about, like, I had no idea what was going on. Like, you know, we, uh, I, I, he goes on, on TV and it's really kind of, I don't know, it's going to sound bad, but it's really kind of sad. He comes on and when, when the scandals first discovered, and he says that um, he comes on TV and he says, like, I know you guys are hearing these stories of this and that, but I can tell you I was not involved at all in this. He makes this big talk on TV. Then a couple of weeks go by and more and more evidence is, is exposed, you know, of his involvement. And um, so he comes back on TV and he says um, that, you know, weeks ago I came on and I said that um, I had no knowledge of what was going on, but the evidence now tells me I did. And I'll be honest with you, he genuinely looks a little confused. And so what we find out later is as soon as he leaves office, he... Um, it's discovered that he had Alzheimer's or was developing Alzheimer's. Some people in his administration said he was already exhibiting signs as president. So, you know, whether he did or didn't, he could have genuinely been confused about it. Anyway, um, uh, one of the guys that leads this whole thing is uh, Colonel Oliver North, who kind of just takes the brunt of everything. He, you know, uh, you know, he falls in the sacrificial sword and he admits to doing all these things and kind of people just kind of like, you know, um, they, he becomes very popular in the conservative movements because he's like, he stood up for the president. He's, you know, he, yes, he did illegal things, but, you know, it was to permit, prevent, you know, to promote American democracy and to prevent the spread of communism. So Reagan kind of gets let off. Even the guy who runs the whole thing, people turn him into a hero. And so this, re, you know, they call, you know, Reagan Teflon president because nothing seems to stick to him. Now we look at the Cold War and we look at Reagan. Um, he focuses his whole idea of like, you know, USSR is evil and we have to do something about it. And there's, it's like a zero sum game. You know, he increases nuclear weapons, you know, threatens Moscow with more weapons and, you know, to put the fear of God into them. And so. Um, and what he, he goes forth and he comes and he has these people, uh, the defense department developed something um, called the strategic defense initiative or SDI. It was nicknamed star Wars, but star Wars is big in the eighties. And the concept was we're going to set up a series of lasers and satellites and all this stuff. And when the Russians launch their missiles, these lasers and satellites with missiles and stuff will shoot them down in space and they'll never make it to America. He goes on TV and makes this huge speech about it. He gets like, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Special effects people to create this whole thing where he can show this is what we're going to be able to do. What this does is if this is real, you know, there goes the, you know, mutually assured destruction, the thing that keeps us from using weapons. And this, you know, destroys the balance. 
you know, in reality, we didn't have any of this yet. It was in the development stage. We're not, we've never fully fleshed it out, but it was, you know, it was one of the best acting jobs he does is he was a former actor. And so, you know, um, it, it was his way of like trying to bring uh, the Soviets to the table, you know, because now it seems like we have the upper hand. You know, around that time, you know, a new leader um, comes into comes into office in the Soviet Union, and his name is Mikhail Gorbachev. In '85, he takes control, and Mikhail Gorbachev is a very different leader than those that have come before. By this point, um, this idea of communism in Russia is failing. The economy is stagnated. You know, they can't. The United States, I mean, the USSR cannot self-support themselves. You know, and also, you know, all this military spending isn't helping. So he's looking for to try to do something new and which is open up Russia. Under him, there's this idea of perestroika, which is, you know, slowly introducing capitalism and property ownership to, to you know, um, the Russian economy. You also have glasnost, which is the sense of being more open, um, having uh, allowing for freedom of speech, allowing for competitive elections. This is a very different guy. And, but, you know, he's inheriting, you know, the Soviet Union is falling apart under him. So he's trying things different, you know, trying to do different things because obviously what they were doing before was not working. And so, you know, they come to the table and negotiate and they start to, you know, negotiate more and more arms treaties. And um, slowly, the Cold War starts to fall. Um, one last thing that happens under the Reagan um, um, presidency is he appoints the first female justice to the Supreme Court, Ms. Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, she she's mostly conservative, but she did provide a few swing votes going both ways. Um, and you know, uh, you know, in in the sense, you know, this it's a historic thing for Reagan because you know it's the first woman on the Supreme Court. So he, he he exits the presidency a little bruised, but really come out. I mean, you know, come out shining to most of America, even though with all these scandals. And so you know he he can't run again. He's still very popular. So um, his vice president, you know, George Bush Senior, um, rides the waves of Reagan's popularity into the office and so he um he he presides under when the cold you know when, when the soviet union finally dissolves in 91 the berlin wall comes down and uh, he he presides over this period he also provide presides over um the very first war in iraq um, known as uh, you know operation desert storm the first persian gulf war what basically happens is um the dictator of iraq saddam hussein um decides to take it upon himself to invade and take kuwait because he wants their oil fields his justification for this is during world war one under the ottoman empire kuwait was part of iraq so he's just retaking part of iraq um but uh the, you know the international community is in uproar against this even, you know, and, and we formed this huge um, coalition uh, to try to get, um, you know, Saddam Hussein out. And we have the support of even the Arab countries. These are worried if Saddam Hussein is going to invade Iraq, what's going to stop them from stop him from invading them? So they support it as well. So they get this huge coalition together, you know, and everyone's pretty much an ingredient. You know, we have to do this. And but the idea behind it was that. Um, we were only going to get them out of Kuwait. We're not there to, you know, overthrow a government, assassinate somebody. You know, there was a limit to what we're going to do. And this is why we had a lot of international support. It was a very brief war. And, you know, we get them out of Kuwait, but he remains in power. Um, under Bush, though, um, he's having, um, you know, he's experiencing, a, you know, a good amount of, uh, you know, popularity with the Gulf War and, you know, just kind of riding the coattails of Reagan, his tax cuts, his increased military spending. Um, but one thing about um, uh, Bush is he's all, you know, he, he also understands the fact that we just can't keep spending, you know, especially we just had a war. We got to do something to make some money. So after promising no new taxes, he goes ahead and raises taxes, which is like a death knell for a Republican president. So um, he does one term. Changed by um, William Jefferson Clinton out of Arkansas, um, and uh, he's a, Clinton's a very you know very popular guy, you know uh, very friendly. People like the way you know 
you know, like him and, you know, he gets people to like him. So very, you know, he's able to drum up this popular support for himself. And then, you know, there's this reduce of support for, for Bush because, you know, he raised taxes. And so in 92, you know, um, J- um, Clinton becomes president of the United States. Now, Clinton supports a, a, a variety of things that we see today. And, you know, with the term we use now is globalization, all these free trade agreements to allow trade to flow. So we have NAFTA, we have creation of the World Trade Organization, GATT, try to make, you know, try to get tariffs out of the way and make the flow of goods, you know, um, quicker, easier, more efficient and cheaper. And this, in a sense, is the giving birth to the society we live in, but we have like our cell phones that are, you know, there's components from different places. They don't just all get put together in one place. So, you know, and, and you know, but you, this allows it to have the lowest price possible because you can get the cheap part here, here, and here. Um, but on the other side, you know, Clinton was a Democrat, yes, but he actually had a lot of conservative policies. Um, he um, also, um, you know, went with that idea that the welfare system was too big about, you know, this whole welfare clean, queen that, you know, people, you know, this idea that, you know, um, we need to start cutting benefits and stuff like that, putting limits on how long you could be on welfare or food stamps, um, allowing states to use the money for different things. And so these are kind of stuff that Republicans support. So he, he, you know, he garners a report, I mean, the support of Republicans through doing this. You know, and but what he also does and, you know, he looks to try to find a way to balance the budget and reduce the federal deficit. Um, And so you can see like our debt reaching higher and higher. But then under Clinton, he starts to look to do other things. And um, one of the things he does in order to um, help balance the budget is he controls spending, federal spending. And then eventually, you know, um, he ends up having to tax the rich more. And once he starts to do this, we see for the first time in a long time, we don't have a debt. We have a surplus. So um, you think the American people would be happy about this, but because of the way he paid for it, using... um, uh, what do you call it, you know, taxation of the rich and stuff, he becomes very unpopular with Republicans. And But under him, you see this huge boost in the, in, in the American economy. Um, you have new technologies emerging, which are helping given, you know, which are, you know, contributing to our GDP. You know, you start, you're starting to see the beginnings of like, you know, the internet and the beginnings of all kinds of new tech that's coming out and contributing to our, you know, nat- gross national product. And so our economy is doing really well under now foreign policy issues um, under P- President Clinton, we send troops to um, Bosnia and Serbia and Kosovo, where they're having what they would refer to as ethnic cleansing. Um, basically, these countries had a mixed population of Christians and Muslims. The Muslims were, you know, at a certain point, they, what they call this ethnic cleansing, they saw them as foreigners. So the Christians decided to get rid of the Muslims in huge mass killings. We're guessing anywhere from 800,000 to a couple million were slaughtered in these countries. So we sent in peacekeeping troops to try and bring the slaughter to an end. Additionally, the um, well, United States sends troops to Somalia. There's this huge famine going on. Relief efforts aren't helping because a lot of warlords are getting a hold of the food that people are sending. And so the people aren't getting fed. And so uh, we sent in troops to try to um, um, regulate who's getting the food, making sure the people are getting the food and, you know, and basically break up these warlords. This leads to a huge embarrassing um, incident known as the Black Hawk Down incident. They've made a movie about it and stuff where, you know, they were able to, you know, capture and take control and kill some of these uh, forces that were there in, 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 um, in um, Somalia. And it's a big embarrassment to the United States. And after that, we just kind of pull out of there, leaving a lot of military people very angry because, you know, they're like, why did we go in the first place to kill our people? Then we, you know, we can't even continue with the mission. Also, domestically, you know, crime and terrorism is up in, you know, in the 90s. It's climbing in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, uh, you know, despite what you may see and hear in the news, you know, crime is so much lower today than it was when I grew up. 
Um, so we see a lot of huge incidences happen. Um, in 1992, there's this incident with Rodney King. Was you know they filmed him being beat, you know, mercilessly by a group of police officers. So you know, uh, and and you know, African Americans living there like this is an everyday happenstance to them. But it's finally caught on film, and they felt like, see, you know, their vindication. Something's going to happen to the cops. You know, something better happened to the cops. Um, but they go to trial and they were acquitted, which leads to this huge riot. Days, you know, um, L.A. burns. People die. And it's just an ugly, ugly incident. And, you know, it, it, it just shows the disparities of what's going on in that community that had been abused so long. They finally think they're going to get justice and justice is denied them. What else do they have left? And they just, you know, they lose it. Um, we also have um, another the huge terrorist act at the time was the bombing of, of the federal building in Oklahoma City by Timothy McVeigh, who um, this bomb was set off in this building. It was a fertilizer bomb. You know, um, part of the building that was destroyed was a daycare center. You know, really, really sad. Um, his um, reasoning for this is, you know, um, couple of years before that there was a raid in Waco which killed you know with the Branch Davidians which um, in the, you know they were seen as a government overreach and it was just a, 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 they saw it as a slaughter of these people and so this was his revenge for that um, in, incidentally I just saw Netflix um, opened up uh, there's a really good um, I think it's a four or five part series on Waco it's a mini series film it gives you a lot of background about what happened in Waco but anyway also under this time period we also have one of the major school shootings, Columbine. Uh, and, you know, sadly, we've had so many since. But at the time, this was like the big, biggest, most shocking one. This is also during the Clinton administration. Um, um, internationally, we see the rise of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden. Um, terrorist attacks are, um, are carried out. In, you know, against our, um, our embassies in Tanzania and in Kenya, there's an attack on the USS Cole, which was that dock. Um, and so they sail, they sh um, sail the boat right into it with a bomb blowing up. And you can see the hole there in the ship. Um, and then, of course, there's the, um, the first attack on the World Trade Center. It was a car bomb. It destroyed, you know, parts of the basement and a couple of floors. It didn't collapse, obviously, but it was the first real attack in America. You know, uh, the first real attack on the World Trade Center in America. Then, of course, you have the one on September 11th. So, you know, this is the era that Clinton is presiding over. And uh, like I said, um, the Republicans weren't too happy with him, especially when, you know, he, he taxes them. And especially since, you know, um, he a lot of his policies, even though they were in line with him, with them, they they wanted more, which he wouldn't do. So you know they search for something, and of course the truth is, you know, you know, there's, there's no lying about it. Clinton, you know, had many many affairs as governor, and then you know as president. So um, they were looking to try and catch him on something. So they found out he had he had an affair with um, on his White House intern Monica Lewinsky. So they um, depose him. Under oath, they ask him questions. And um, so, because if you lie under oath, that's a that's a violation of law, it's perjury. So if you can violate, you know, if you commit perjury, you committed a crime and therefore we can impeach you. So the question becomes, and I'm sorry, you know, this, the material, you know, that I'm about to talk about, but you know, this is genuinely what happened, is that um, they found out, you know, that he had an affair as White House intern, and she had evidence of that affair on her dress. Um, and, you know, her friend told her to keep it. So she kept it. Um, so this all comes out. So he's being deposed and they ask him the question, you know, did you have sex with Monica Lewinsky? And he said, like, you know, according to my definition of sex, I did not have sex with Monica Lewinsky. And so the reason he says it that way is it was just oral sex. And so in his eyes, that wasn't sex. But according to the court, that was sex. And he you know, committed perjury. And so he can be tried. So he's impeached, but he's not removed from office. You know, we also have changing demographics occurring in the United States at this time. 
we have another mass migration in the opposite direction. You know, in the 20s, we had the great migration going south to the north. And now as, you know, industries are closing down in the United States, um, you know, all these factories are closing down. We refer to it as the rust belt. These are just like, you know, these buildings that are just not being used anymore. These people move south in search for work. Um, and then people that are older are moving south because of, you know, developments in air conditioners. Now you can live, you know, comfortably in hot, hot states. And, you know, and, and the cost of living is lower. So we have a huge shift of people coming south. Um, we also have an increase in immigration. And we start to see, you know, um, just a very shifting democratic, dem demographics in the United States. Um, innovations, you know, aerospace, you know, cell phones, um, new technologies, you know, internet, globalization, you know, and you start to see you know, the high tech era we, we, you know, we see now. So by the late 90s, this is start, you know, we, we start to see um, the bubble about to burst. You know, um, you know they, we've overextended ourselves in technology. And so this is, you know, th this is something that's going to happen later. Um, and so we, we, you know, we see it as 2000 approaches, we see um, prosperity maybe coming to an end. We see, you know, this re hateful rhetoric between the Republicans and Democrats all over the Clinton impeachment. We're seeing attacks. So this comes into the controversial election of 2000. Um, in 2000, you had um, two main people running. You had a third running as an independent. You had George Bush Jr. You had Al Gore, Vice President of Clinton, you know, like George Bush Sr., you know, riding the coattails of Clinton's popularity. And you had Ralph Nader, who was a consumer advocate. Um, and so in 2000, we the polls. And the election came super close. This is the craziest election in U.S. history. And it came down to Florida. There were issues with the ballots in Florida, um, especially in certain counties in Florida. They were using this weird system where you had to poke a hole into the ballot. And if it didn't go you know, all the way through, you can imagine this area that they were doing, you know, they're having issues. There was a lot of old people there and they just couldn't quite punch it through. So a lot of ballots got rejected. So then they initiate this recount and have them like looking at these things. Like, did they mean to poke it? Did they not mean to poke it? Is this a real ballot? Is this not a ballot? And, you know, and so this is a painstaking process. The process starts and stops like three different times because of different court injunctions. Um, it goes to the state Supreme Court and the state Supreme Court orders yet another recount. Um, but this is just we're taking way too long. We're, you know, we're, we, we, I remember um, when, you know, living in that time and every day it was like, you know, do we have a president yet? Do we have a president yet? So we're getting to December. The president gets you 